Dr. K, is it true that chore charts, allowances, sticker charts, that these things are elements of coercive control and are going to harm my child? How do I think about chores, rewards, sticker charts, and handle them in a way that is consistent with my values? If you're a post-traumatic parent and you've been asking these questions, welcome. Please click subscribe below so we never miss another episode so we can talk about this concept, this idea of how do we think as post-traumatic parents who are breaking cycles, how do we think about chore charts, reward charts, allowances? Is there a way to handle them that is gentle, responsive, not coercive, and consistent with the values of post-traumatic parenting. So the first thing I want to think about is the concept that we have in the post-traumatic parenting book that's forthcoming in 2025 is this idea of responsive and responsible parenting. I call it R2 parenting. You want to be responsive. We want to validate our children, come from a place of understanding child development, child temperament, come from a place of understanding that little humans are works in progress, that good behavior or obedience in children is not the hallmark of good parenting, but responsiveness, kindness, respect, and a wonderful relationship are. And then on the other hand, we also want to be responsible. We want to teach our children skills. We want to teach our children to develop good habits. We want to show our children how to think about their future self, how to delay gratification, how to tolerate frustration, how to manage their time and their resources in a way that perhaps wasn't modeled for us, in a way that gives them a skill that they'll have for life. I think for a lot of post-traumatic parents, this becomes a dilemma because when we're trying to be responsible, we worry that we're not being responsive enough. And especially when perhaps we were raised by harsh, demanding, critical, invalidating parents, it's scary to think about getting a child to tolerate frustration because in tolerating frustration, the child will feel distress and you will feel like you are the source of that distress. And you just want the distress to stop because somehow the trauma app in your brain starts getting triggered and the trauma app starts thinking, danger, 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 you are doing what your parents did to you. Even though saying to a child, we can't go outside until we put on our shoes. I can help you put on your shoes. We can pick from these two different kinds of shoes. I know it's frustrating. You really want to go outside without your shoes and we can't go outside until we're wearing our shoes. We have to keep our feet safe. Is a very far cry from being, you know, whipped with your stepdad's belt but your trauma app doesn't know the difference. So the trauma app in back of your brain is going, danger, 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 you're abusing your kid, just like your stepdad abused you, don't do that. So it's very easy for post-traumatic parents who are trying to be responsive to sort of slip into permissive because we don't ever wanna be that abusive person. We don't want our children to go through what we went through. We forget, my kid is not me, my kid has me. And there's a difference. So because of that, a lot of post-traumatic parents have a hard time being responsible because of our child's distress and feeling like the source of our child's distress. But there is a big difference between the, you know, where I know if I don't make my two-year-old wear his sneakers and he goes outside, the tar is going to burn his feet. It will hurt. I am older and wiser with more experience in the world. I know this. So as sad as he is, and again, I can be so responsive. You are so sad. Your feelings are so big. They're as big as your head. You really, really, really don't want to wear your sneakers. We can't go outside till we wear our sneakers. Do you want to wear the blue ones or the red ones? And then, yeah, he might cry and scream. He might say, yucky, mommy. He might say, I hate you. And trauma app is going to be screaming, I'm ruining attachment. I'm doing something terrible. But I'm not. I'm holding a behavioral 
boundary. When? Then. When you put on your shoes, then we can go outside. And yeah, sometimes we're very, very, very late. And sometimes I just have to put the shoes on. And that is consistent with being responsive. On the other hand, responsible parenting techniques like sticker charts or chores or um, an allowance based on chores, any of those things can sometimes be overdone by a parent who is trying to socially engineer perfection into her child. I need my kid needs to get into Harvard and he's six years old and I need to make a sticker chart to get him to practice violin so that he gets into Harvard because then his math scores will get high. Right. And we can get on this like merry go round of trying to optimize our children's lives when the minute we're talking optimization we're talking trauma because optimizing that's a trauma response right then and there i know that sounds like why is that a trauma response because humans aren't perfect trying to do something perfect perfectionism very often comes from a sense of inadequacy and inadequacy very often comes from trauma so let's not right let's not do that Let's instead be both responsive and responsible. And here is the way to do that. So let's say you're asking about a chore chart where you want to create a sticker chart where your child does a couple of chores. We're talking about, you know, a five year old. So we're talking about, you know, or maybe let's 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 say a six or seven year old. So we're talking about like mild minor chores perhaps it's things like you know cleaning up after yourself like you know putting your dishes after you eat in the dishwasher maybe it's setting the table for the family maybe it's cleaning up the playroom um right like 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 developmentally appropriate chores we're not asking you to wash the car we're not asking you to you know cook dinner we're not we're not asking for any of that we're asking for something developmentally appropriate that the child probably is okay with doing. Maybe sometimes it's not about chores, it's about self-maintenance, so like remembering to brush your teeth, remembering to put your, you know, put on your indoor shoes and take off your outdoor shoes when you come in, or, um, or you know, laying out your clothes the night before, and you wanna create some sort of a sticker chart. So here's the thing about creating a sticker chart. The way I look at it is I have an acronym called CHART, and if you follow this acronym, then you can responsively also be responsible. The C in chart stands for consent. Consent means you don't just like throw this on the child. This is what you're going to do and then this is your reward. You have a conversation with the kid and you say something like, there are some, you're a citizen of this family, there are some jobs that need to get done and everybody in the family is going to pitch in to make this a great place to live. Here are some jobs that exist. Which one do you think you could do? Do you think you at seven years old are capable of setting the table? Are you capable of, you know, you know, self-maintenance, remembering to brush your teeth on your own? Are you capable, right? And the child consents. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I would like to get a reward in exchange. I would like to get an allowance in exchange for doing these three jobs or for doing remembering these, you know, self-maintenance tasks. Yeah, I consent. I get it. Sometimes we have to sort of like educate into consent, like, you know, we might have to have a conversation with a child about why brushing teeth is so important and how future you is going to be so happy that you brushed your teeth, right? And future you is going to send you a thank you note from the future. Thank you past me for brushing your teeth because now I have teeth that are healthy and clean and I don't have to get a, you know, we're at the dentist and the dentist says, I've literally had, had my kids do this out loud. The dentist says, no cavities, we're all good. And I say, now say thank you past me, right? And we do that. So that's consent. So sometimes consent comes from the kid. Like, yeah, you know what? I love to vacuum. I feel so powerful making that loud noise with the vacuum cleaner. I would like to do that. Yeah, I like to set the table. Then I get to choose which dishes to use or whatever. Sometimes we manufacture consent, but not by forcing consent, by educating consent. Do you care about future you? Do you like getting a needle at the dentist? Um, do you think that this job needs to get done like the playroom needs to get cleaned up because otherwise it's not a very pleasant place to play and we can't find our toys it's not fun to come to dinner and have to wait a half hour because we're all scrambling to get everything when the table is set it's such a much more enjoyable meal right so we're educating consent and then the child is like yeah you know what of all the jobs i like that one i'll do it that's the c h is hope you have to relate to this as teaching your child about their future self. 
future me is going to be so happy that I did this. Future me, right now me does not want to do this because right now me wants what it wants when it wants it, right? Right now me would like to keep watching TV, would not like to get up and set the table because arbitrarily the clock turns 6 p.m. However, future me will be very happy I did this. Future me that is, you know, using my allowance to buy the toy I want, that future me is going to be very happy that I did this. So that's what hope is. Whenever we're working on any sort of system with a child, we always want to talk about future me, future me, future me. We want to like always be orienting them towards the concept of future me. I very often will slip this into casual conversations with my children where I'll say something like, if I wake up in the morning and I'm well rested and I had a good night's sleep, I'll say, thank you past me for going to bed on time. That was really nice of you because I feel great right now. If I come to the fridge and like, you know, the dinner I cooked yesterday is there, I'll, you know, take out the dinner I cooked yesterday and say, thank you past me for cooking this dinner because now it is all ready and all I have to do is warm it up. My kids are used to hearing me say things like that because I want them thinking about future me. My daughter, got, a, you know, was like really, really happy with her grade on something that she had studied for for a long time. And the first thing she said is, thank you past me for putting in all that work and studying because I am really proud of this grade, right? Like she just thought that way because she's so used to hearing me say that. Past me, future me. We always want to create hope. We want to think in terms of ability level. If a child does not have the ability level for a certain skill, don't require it of them. So if even if it's something that other kids their age should be able to do, if your kid has ADHD, they're not going to remember that it's 6 p.m. You want to put a reminder onto their smartwatch so it buzzes at 6 p.m. Sure. But if it's not within their ability level, then don't ask them to do it. Sometimes you have to troubleshoot ability level. Like, you know, I can brush my teeth, but I do need a reminder. Um, you know, I can brush my teeth, but I'll do a very like poor job of it unless you buy me one of those toothbrushes that vibrates for the amount of time I need to be brushing take ability level into into account because remember a chore is not about getting the job done a chore is about teaching the child responsibility giving the child a sense of satisfaction of being a citizen of a family um and teaching a child to invest in future me so if it's so if you're not thinking about their ability level it's probably because you need the job done that's not the issue here job done is not what we're doing teaching you to do the job, that is what we are doing. Okay, the R is about rewards. But here's the thing with rewards, whether that's an allowance, whether that's whether that's a, you know, sticker on a chart towards a toy or whatever. When we're thinking about a reward, the reward has to be reasonable because and the reward has to not be coercive. In other words, the whole family's going on a trip to Disneyland because you brushed your teeth for a week. Yeah, well, what if you stop brushing your teeth and the whole family is going to be mad at you and you're going to feel blamed and shamed. So it has to be a reasonable reward. It has to be something you want, right? If I, if you're not a reader and I reward you with a book, it's not a reward. If someone rewards me, like, you know, if someone rewards me with like a meditation class, I do meditation sometimes because I know it's good for me, but it's not a reward. It's not something that I'm like, oh my God, I'm chomping at the bit for that. You know, offer me a, you know, a latte and maybe, right? So it has to be a reasonable reward that the child does want Personally, I'm a bigger fan of like a gift card in a store than money only because, you know, money is so easily lost, stolen, misplaced. Um, it's also really easy um, for a kid to sort of even forget they have the money. So I'd much rather like $20 gift card in Target that you can then spend on whichever Lego set you want is a little bit more, it's very concrete. Sometimes buying the toy and sticking stickers on the box until it has a certain amount of stickers and then you're getting it. Um, but again, the idea is not to coerce. This is not, this is not EBA therapy. This is not, you know, this is very simply future you will be so happy that you did this. The final T in our chart acronym is trackable. You want to make sure that whatever the deal you made between you and your child, it is trackable, that you can commit to keeping track of it. And sometimes the best way to commit to keeping track of it is having the child keep track of it themselves. So if there's something where, you know, there's a morning routine or an evening routine where it's something like, you know, getting into the habit of brushing your teeth or hanging up your coat or clearing the table, where the minute it's done, you check something off so that it happens immediately. Some of us, myself included, when I am the secretary to keep track of somebody's chart, I will sometimes forget. 
Now here's something very, very, very important that I think anybody, no matter where you land on this debate, will agree to. Never, ever, ever lie to kids. Lying to kids does so much harm to their psyche. There was actually a very interesting study. Remember the marshmallow experiment where they gave a kid, a kid came into the room and they said, here's a marshmallow. If you wait a couple of minutes, you can have two marshmallows. And they asked the kid, what's more worth it? One marshmallow or two marshmallows? And of course the child said two marshmallows. And then they had the children wait and they followed those children throughout their, you know, for a very longitudinal study, which means for many, many years till adulthood. And they discovered that the kids who waited, who did not eat the marshmallow, did much better in life on many measures like economic measures, um, career measures, relationship satisfaction. They just did better. And the conclusion was the children who did not eat the marshmallow were able to delay gratification. And that was a key component in their later life success. But then there was this interesting study that was done where they wanted to see what happens if you lie to a child. So what they did was they had the children come into an office and the researcher on the way up, the researcher would say something like, do you, have, do you like pretzels? I think I have a tin of pretzels in my office. So before we do our experiment, we can have some pretzels. Then they would get to the office and, the, and with a very big show of surprise, the researcher would open this pretzel box and it was empty. And the researcher would say, oh, sorry, looks like we're out of pretzels. Okay, anyway, we're gonna do the experiment now. And the re that particular study showed that the children who were lied to in this mild benign way, like not getting pretzels is not gonna change the trajectory of their lives, but not getting the pretzels was enough to make much more of the children fail the experiment in the sense that they just ate the marshmallow right away. Cause like, I don't believe you now. Why should I delay gratification upon your word? I don't know that you're giving me a second marshmallow. For all I know, you're gonna come in and take the first marshmallow too. You just told me you're untrustworthy. So if our goal in creating some sort of a chore chart for children is to teach them about their future self and how future you is gonna be so happy that Today, you delayed frustration, delayed gratification, embraced tolerated frustration in order to get this reward and also to be so proud of how you contributed it as a citizen of our family. But I lie to you that I kind of broke that capacity. So I like the best kind of systems are the ones where the child tracks it themselves. That way it can be super easy. Um, I worked with a family where it was so easy because the kids had, you know, they had dumb phones, but the phones had cameras on them and they were able to, you know, every time the little girl cleaned the playroom floor or hung up her coat or whatever the thing that her parent wanted her to do was, um, she would take a picture and text it to her mom. End of the week, it was really easy to just, Oh, Monday's picture, Tuesday's picture, Wednesday's picture, Thursday's picture, Friday's picture. Great, you got your reward. So nobody's brain had to do the heavy lifting of remembering because it is very hard to remember these things. So the easiest way to do it is to build the tracking of the behavior into the system for the child so that they're keeping track of it. Um, and again, this might be different with a kid who is neuro or psychodiverse where their brain does not have the capacity to track it and then you might have to be tracking it there are apps and all sorts of systems for tracking tasks and completion of tasks and to-do lists that are not that onerous to use that can help but the idea being again this is not a behavioral approach to parenting this is not an idea that every single thing a child does needs to be done on a behavioral system this is about that chart acronym the something a capacity that the child consents to, that the child needs, or that the child has now been educated about the importance of. There's hope. We're paying attention to the child's ability levels and not asking for something that's way too big for the child. It's a reasonable reward, something that the child actually wants, something that makes sense for the child so that they learn to delay gratification and wait for something that they want, and then that anticipation. And like I said about rewards, the fact that this is not a trip to the ice cream store.
This is an acknowledgement of someone who knows how to think of their future self. This is someone who contributed to our family all week long, even when it would have been more fun to just run outside and not clear the table. You are somebody to be proud of. You're somebody who should feel a sense of like self-efficacy. I am someone who can accomplish things. I am someone who can work towards my goals. Because so many people have told me that I like to do, I, I would like to do a chart about specific things, you know, for example, summer homework or, you know, reading practice, something my child finds onerous, but they know they need to do, but I'm worried they'll only do it for the sake of the reward. And that's why we have to educate them. You are not only doing it for the sake of the reward. You are doing it for the sake of future you. Future you who will be a better reader. Future you who will be able to read the book that, that like is so exciting that you'd like to read that you now cannot read. Future you who doesn't want to go out for extra reading help next year and wants to be able to read on pace with the class. Future you who really wants that Lego set. That's why you're doing it. And like I said, this is not about every single struggle we have with our children. I think a big problem with the parenting in the 80s is that what people were saying was authoritative parenting was actually authoritarian parenting. Kids don't need to be perfect. We don't need to have a behavior plan for every single tiny little behavior. But what we do want to do is sometimes when it comes to chores, delayed gratification, um, having a child work on something that they really do find onerous, but that they also know they need to work on, it can be incorporated in this gentle and responsive way towards your parenting plan. Because in the end, kid, it's all about you and what you want in life. And it's all about teaching you to be someone who doesn't eat the marshmallow. It's all about teaching you to be that person who knows how to delay gratification and knows how to work towards a goal. Remember one other thing, I wanna just reiterate this point. If you have a chart, I am a big believer in we don't ever lose points. We don't lose stickers, we don't lose points, we don't lose check marks, we don't go back on once we've earned something, meaning we, let's say we're working for a $20 gift card to be spent in Target on whatever um, as soon as, you know, a certain amount of reading practice was done. And we've done that. We have earned that on our way to Target. And in the car on the way to Target, your kid is absolutely horrible to his little sister. He slaps her. He calls her a mean name. He has a meltdown. I mean, like, everything is going wrong. Now we're going to leave the, let's have a conversation with him about, like, What's going on? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you feeling this way? Forget all of that for a second. The temptation for many parents is, that's it, forget it. Today is not the day, you are not going to Target, you are not gonna spend your 20 bucks, I'll save the gift card for another time maybe, or forget it, I'm canceling the gift card, I'm ripping it up, you don't get it because you hit your sister. Resist that temptation. You're annoyed, you're frustrated, it was supposed to be a pleasant outing and now he hit his sister. You're not, there's like this outdated thinking that he's going to think that he can hit his sister and still get to go to Target. Most children can understand that he's getting to go to Target and spend his $20 gift card because that is what he earned. Later on, though, we will have a conversation about hands are not for hitting. We will have a conversation about you must have been very frustrated and you hit your sister. There's probably a better way to handle frustrated feelings. I want to hear what they are. How do you think you can fix it with your sister? These are two separate issues. You can still go to Target, spend the gift card, do all of those things, come home, and then have that postmortem about the fight in the car with the sister and why that happened and how we need to handle our frustration in the future. So don't confuse things, right? We're late to a trip to the dentist. We're not taking a sticker off your chart for doing your math homework because you made us late to the dentist. Math homework and dentists have nothing to do with each other unless your dentist happens to be your math teacher and even so. So let's just remember all of those. That being said, as a post-traumatic parent, I get why it's difficult to do the chore chart kind of thing with your child, especially if you had parents who were critical, shaming, blaming, who were overly controlling, or who parentified you and made you you know, have family responsibilities that were way bigger than a child your age was able to have. So it makes sense that you would be hesitant to give your child any responsibility at all. The fact is, when they're not being raised in a traumatogenic environment, like the home you grew up in, when they're being raised in a happy, healthy, functioning home, children want to help. 
They actually enjoy being citizens of the family. And it's the same thing with doing homework, even a homework assignment that's annoying, like math practice or reading practice for a kid who's not very good at that. They want to be good at reading. They want to be on grade level. And it feels yucky to know you have homework that you haven't done. It feels yucky to know that you need to be doing a certain amount of reading practice over the summer so that you get to be in the reading group you want to be in next year. It feels yucky to know that you're not living up to that. And when children are being raised in a functional, non-traumatogenic home, then they want to do those things. They want to contribute. They want to be part of things. So when we make it when we make it exciting and fun and collaborative and all about their future self, they want to do that. So don't let your trauma app warn you that you're being abusive like your parents. You aren't. The fact that you're watching this video means that you are very different than your parents and that you are giving your children a very different childhood. If you enjoyed this video, if this type of question is something that you as a post-traumatic parent have, please click subscribe below so you never miss another episode. Please tell a friend about post-traumatic parenting. Our social media community is growing one parent at a time who tells another friend. So if you like this video, if you have parenting questions that you want me to answer, comment below, ask your question. I will gladly respond to them in another YouTube video. If you have a book that you've read recently about parenting and you want some or about any trauma related topic and you want some clarity, click subscribe below. Recently, I reviewed the book Bad Therapy based on a comment that came in on another YouTube video where someone asked me to do that. So I will respond to your questions and comments. If you want to hang out where the post-traumatic parenting community hangs out, check out at Dr. Kosselowitz Psychology on Instagram. If you want long-form interviews with experts on the topics of post-traumatic parenting, check out the Post-Traumatic Parenting Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, the Post-Traumatic Parenting book is coming out in 2025, so be on the lookout for that. Till next time.